I've been on some pretty awesome trips with my nature journals, including Tanzania, Ecuador, Costa Rica, and a lot more. Right now, I'm gonna share with you my top tips for getting ready for such an expedition, whether you're going to Tanzania, somewhere in your own neighborhood, or the Galapagos Islands. These tips are gonna help you get ready and make the most out of your trip. So the more that I think about it, nature journaling is probably one of the best ways to take a once in a lifetime trip and make the most out of it. So um, when I reflect on like, what would I most want to get out of this trip and what would I want to help other people um, get the most out of this trip? What I realized is maybe, um, you know, just getting as much nature journaling in as possible on the trip and being able to focus as much as possible on the nature journaling would be the best way to make the most of that trip. And so I don't need to preach to the choir since you all know a lot of the reasons why nature journaling is so great already, um, you know, but it can definitely, um, you know, add depth to an experience, but it also can provide a record. So it's like, I can look back at my um, two Tanzania trip nature journals from when I went with Jack and I have this like amazing record of that time. And it's something just, just priceless, you know, um, to be able to look back at that. And it's really different from like scrolling through photos on my computer and trying to find photos from a trip. It's just not the same. Um, but one thing that I think is really important to start off with is, um, and this is my number, number one thing to do be, to prepare for the, for a trip whether it's the Galapagos or some other type of nature journaling expedition is to set in an intention. So for some of us, um, I don't want to like um, project my intention uh, onto everyone else, but for some of us, maybe it isn't actually nature journaling as many pages as possible or getting as much nature journaling in as possible. You might have like an intention that like this is going to be like a super relaxing trip for you or it's going to be like an opportunity to get to know specific people better perhaps um, like someone that you're traveling with or maybe getting to know people um, better that you haven't um, that don't have a relationship with yet that could be your intention um, or your intention could just be like appreciating the unique um, wildlife in that area as much as possible or maybe like learning something about yourself um, or developing like a specific skill so actually spending some time and then writing down what that intention is um, before because what can happen is um, on the trip so like my intention is going to be basically doing as much nature journal like filling as many pages um, as i can um, during the trip that's going to be my intention but that might not be everybody's so being um, self-aware and like stating that intention and writing it down is really useful. One thing um, that could be even good is you could write that like on the front of your journal or use a sticky note and that serves as this reminder because what can happen is, you know, maybe on the trip um, and this would be for my intention is I might at some point have like this feeling of like, oh, I didn't really want to fill that many nature journal pages. I mainly wanted to, you know, enjoy, um, you know, pina coladas and, and sit on the deck and just kind of enjoy the experience. And the, the crazy thing about the way the human brain works is that the easiest person to lie to a lot of times is actually ourselves, or it can be really confusing of like what we actually want. And then maybe later you're like, oh, I didn't fill that many nature journal pages, or I didn't, um, make, make a, um, effort to meet new people and sort of form new connections or I didn't really pay that much attention to like the cultural aspect and maybe um, you feel like you missed out later or you might have you know an experience where your your internal voice is saying oh I'm only going to um, draw birds I'm not going to try to draw the reptiles um, you know it's just I'm like birds better and maybe that's just that voice inside of you is saying that because you're a little bit less comfortable about um, drawing uh, reptiles. So you just focus on the birds. Um, so sometimes that internal voice might not be really telling the truth. Um, but if you spend some time setting the intention before the trip and remind yourself of the intention, then when those voices come up, you can check it and be like, is this in alignment with that intention? And if it is, um, then, then listen to it and follow it. And if it's not, then maybe it's just you're feeling a little bit tired or you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, but you can push through it. 
as this is probably the most important thing that you can do is um, try to create a nature journaling habit before the trip. So I have like all of these specific expedition um, nature journaling practices or, you know, like researching books. There's all these specific things like that, but actually just creating a nature journaling habit before the trip is probably the best thing that you can do. So if, if for nature journaling as much as possible on the trip. So um, if you, the, my tips for doing that um, are setting a specific time for it, um, focusing on input, not output. So how much time are you gonna put into it? Not like what that page is gonna look like. Um, piggybacking the habit. So um, one habit forming technique is to combine a habit you wanna create with a habit you already have. So if you drink wine at 5 p.m. Um, in the evening and watch the sunset, that would be a perfect time to try to get your daily nature journaling habit in. Um, and then buddy up. Um, so the fourth um, tip for creating a habit is to do it with another person or people. Um, so like, for example, if you regularly go to one of Jack's um, weekly nature journaling things, that's a perfect way to go to a place where there's multiple people or do your nature journaling with a friend every week um, or every day, whatever, um, buddying up. So those are the best ways to help get that habit in place. And nature journaling, what you have around you, even though it's not the kind of nature that's going to be in the Galapagos, just getting in that habit is going to really help. Okay, so then as far as specific training goes, I really think um, there's a lot that can be improved here. One thing that I think is really important, and this dovetails with um, creating a habit of nature journaling before the trip, um, is that you need to dial in your nature journaling setup instead of trying to figure it out on the trip. So for example, if you have a brand new outfit that you're going to be wearing in the Galapagos, or maybe just like a sun shirt, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, that is new and you've never used it with your nature journaling bag or you've never used it with your binoculars. And then the first time you use it, when we're on this short, very special, expensive trip and you turn your bag around and it like gets caught on the buttons or it's like the binoculars are always wrapping around the little lanyard or whatever, that's going to be a problem. So as much as possible, do your get your gear that you're planning to use your hat or whatever, try to get that sooner. Um, and then the other thing that is really good is um, reducing friction. And I call friction every zipper you have to open, every bit of Velcro that you have to, you know, rip off or every single like layer in between you and your nature journal supplies um, is friction. And the more of that there is, the less likely you're going to get your nature journal out um, and get a quick sketch of that, you know, rare one of a kind creature that you're only going to see for 15 minutes on this trip and maybe never in your life. So getting a setup where you can just easily, it's really short kind of, there's, there's a few steps in between you seeing the animal and having an intention of sketching it and you getting your page open and ready to go. So that's reducing the friction. Um, I really like stuff that can be done with one hand. So like, you know, that's one of the things that I really like about Jack's binoculars, the small ones. And the first Serengeti trip, I took two pairs of binoculars because I do have like a bigger pair. And a lot of my friends who are just birders, they think these are really weak um, binoculars and they want to have the like thousand dollar ones that are like bigger and stuff. But one of the things that I love about these is that they're so light, it's really easy for me to use them with one hand. Some of the other binoculars, it's like you have to use two hands. Once you're using two hands for something, that means you're not going to be able to hold your nature journal in the other hand. And this applies to everything about your bag. So like if you can move your bag to the back and move it to the front and you can pull out your nature journal without using two hands, look, mine is catching a little bit there. If you can pull out your nature journal without using two hands, um, the more things you can do with one hand, the better. It's, it's important, I think. Um, fault tolerance. So this is a really nerdy term from engineering that I like to use, 
but fault tolerance is basically the concept that certain um, devices um, or things in nature also, um, some of them, if a little thing goes wrong, suddenly it doesn't work at all. Maybe you've experienced this with one of your devices that like one little thing happens or like the temperature is just a little bit too hot and suddenly that device doesn't work for anything. Um, this can be the case with nature journaling style as well. So depending on your style, um, it might be that a little bit of a, of a smudge on your page um, will make that whole page sort of look bad. Or maybe like your style is so precise and delicate that um, if, your, if your hand is sort of moving because you're on a moving boat, that suddenly none of your images look the way that you want. So um, coming up with like a fault tolerant style where like things can go wrong, but your page is still sort of like legible overall and has like the effect that you want, or just your whole setup is less likely to suddenly not work if one little thing goes wrong. Because when you're traveling, when you're on an expedition, there's always things there's going to be you know, there, you could get splashed with a little bit of salt water on your journal. So um, that's sort of a little one, but it's something that I think about a lot. Another thing is redundancy. So there's this expression, I think it's from the Marines or the Navy SEALs. I usually don't quote uh, military stuff, but it's like one is two is one, one is none. So if there is a pin that you really like, um, bring two of them because um, if you lose one and you're in the Galapagos, you're not going to be able to find the art supplies that you like there. So like when I went on my Grand Canyon rafting trip, it was like a 31 day rafting trip. I, I created a complete clone of my entire nature journal bag um, and I stored it in a separate bag on the raft. Ideally, I would have stored it on a separate raft because if I lost my entire nature journal kit in one of the rapids, and I'm in the middle of a Grand Canyon trip, I'm not going to be able to paint any of those other landscapes or nature journal, any of those other cool things. Um, so I think on our trip, you don't need a, a complete copy of your entire thing, but just maybe think about it. And like when I travel abroad, I like to think about what's in my carry-on and what's in my check-in. And if like, if you have a little bit of redundancy, like maybe a toothbrush, in each one, then the chances if something gets lost, you have um, redundancy. So redundancy on some of your um, items, I think is important. That could apply to binos. I feel like on the tropical birding um, thing, they said to bring two pairs, that might be a little bit too much, um, but you definitely wanna practice, as far as binoculars go, definitely practice using them as much as possible before this trip. One thing I've noticed, and this is even with like professional ornithologists, is if they haven't been birding very much, um, I went with a professional ornithologist on a uh, um, to do a survey, and we were bird, we were using our binoculars and writing stuff down for like, I don't know, like maybe it was like six hours straight, and she started to get um, at the end of the day, she started to get sick a little bit, like. Um, vertigo and it's because she hadn't been doing that much birding lately and just using your binoculars looking through binoculars over and over again can mess with your sort of um, balance and things like that and if you're going back and forth between drawing looking through binoculars and being on a boat there's a lot of things that um, you don't want to be figuring out for the first time so even if you just go birding a lot and just see what it's like looking through your binoculars over and over again pretty intensively before this trip that'll be really good because you don't want to be figuring it out on this trip that your binoculars make you sick um standing so standing i've been learning a lot about this lately because i've been recovering from a fractured patella but um standing is something that we shouldn't take for granted um and i usually am just like oh standing nature journaling is like really important and everyone has their own physical abilities. But um, if you can practice, even doing binoculars standing is different than doing them sitting down. Practice all of the things that we're gonna be doing standing. So if you can practice 
um, drawing standing up, nature journaling standing up. I have a whole video called um, how to draw standing up on my YouTube channel. And I also have one called um, how to draw while looking through your binoculars. Um, both of those could be useful. Otherwise, just practice doing it. Just practice drawing standing up if you can. If standing for long periods of time is something that is physically hard for you already, start thinking about some um, strategies. Um, I want to do a video with um, how to nature journal using hiking poles. Um, some people use those for added stability. Um, and definitely when you're looking through binoculars and standing up, it's a test of your balance. So practicing it, some of those in advance is important. Okay, so that's the nature journaling. Um, that's the nature journaling setup. Trying to test all of those materials um, before the trip, I think, is, is, is going to be totally worth it because you don't want to be wasting time on the trip trying to figure that stuff out. Um, but in addition to nature journaling specific, um, I think that your outfit is actually super, super important. And I think that this is something that sometimes people forget. And this could be the thing that makes you that that could make a huge difference. But like um, protecting your skin is super important. So like sun, we're not going to be in the Galapagos in the hottest um, time of year. But protecting your skin um, is super important and it exhausts you if you're getting too much sun. So like finding like a hat and long sleeves, like sunscreen sucks for nature journaling. Um, as soon as sunscreen is on your hands, it ends up getting onto your paper at some point. Um, and when it gets onto your paper, it, it messes it up for watercolor, but it also messes it up for ink and a lot of other things. So it's just you don't want to have to put sunscreen on your hands. So I highly recommend just long layers. Um, there's amazing sun shirts these days that you can layer up. And then I love sun gloves. I didn't grab mine right now. I use these ones. They're Outdoor Research is the brand, but they're sun gloves. These are amazing. And they have ones that cover your full finger, but I just have the ones that um, cover like part of my finger. And I use those because this part of your, your hands um, you know, just get so much sun and it just ages your skin and all of that. So in addition to your, um, your skin, your eyes, so um, your eyes getting blasted by the sun is exhausting. And as a nature journaler, your eyes are like one of your most important body parts. Like you, even if you can't draw anything, being able to see is, is obviously super important. So um, sunglasses, like definitely testing your sunglasses out before this trip and having a pair that you like. Nature journaling and looking through, looking through binoculars with sunglasses, sometimes it doesn't work. So consider um, getting, there's these straps that you can connect to your sunglasses so that you can put them down or experiment with, can I put my sunglasses up onto my head while I use my binoculars? And does that work? Because, and can you do that with one hand? Because um, sometimes the, the light bouncing off of your paper is going to be blinding you. Sometimes, you know, the bouncing off the ocean or whatever is going to be blinding you. So getting that part figured out. Another thing that doesn't take up very much space and can be a lifesaver is just like um, regular eye drops. Um, and I think these are just like the ones that are for like redness or whatever. But these can be amazing. And I know that I've been on multiple nature drilling expeditions where I was like, I wish I had this in my first aid because my eyes are super dry and super tired and they're my most important body part right now. And I wish I could just have something like the, this is just relieves um, dryness and itchiness um, and it's whatever it's from CVS or Rite Aid or Walgreens um, could be really useful. Um, the other body part that is super important, I already talked about hands. Sometimes having a warm set of gloves could be useful if it's like the morning or whatever, but like really taking care of your hands um, is super important. The other one is your butt. So um, I think this might not be as much of an issue on this trip, but like thinking about options maybe for small folding stools. I don't know if we're going to have a chance um, when we're on the actual islands to be like sitting down um, but it might be worth thinking about um, and maybe even on the boat having your own folding chair could be useful 
I love this one called the um, Joey chair. Let me see if I have it right here. So I have two and for the longest time, I used this like really minimalist one that actually fits in my backpack and it's basically just a stool. If you have a stool, I would put that into this category. So it's like a very light, lightweight seat. It's gonna make a difference. You won't have to kneel or sit on the dirt. Like you're not, most of these islands, you're not gonna wanna sit on the sharp lava or on the dirt. Um, something like this is really small. If you have one of those ones that has like the three legs, there's these REI ones that fold out. They're really small. You could probably carry it. I know lots of nature journalers carry those, those types of stools. That's option number one, but this is not really going to be that comfortable for long periods and sitting on the boat, it's not going to be comfortable. This one, however, this is the um, travel chair by Joey chair. I can put a link to it later, but this thing is amazing. I got it for my Grand Canyon trip, um, but have used it so much since and it has back so you can actually sit back into it. It's so comfortable and it's so sturdy it is um an amazing chair i like i'm gonna bring this for sure even though this is kind of a big piece of um of equipment to bring i find that it's worth it and i'll sit in this and nature journal for a lot longer than i would be able to if i didn't like really really good for landscape painting or just relaxing like i will use this on the deck of the ship it has rubber feet that work well in sand you could sit on rocks with it. I've um, been in sand dunes, rocks, in the water. I've sat in the water with it. It's um, really, really good. And I think, I don't, depending on where you like to shop, I think I paid like a hundred for mine, but depending on what color you get, I think it can be as low as like $65 um, on Amazon. So that's your butt. Another thing some people do that's really minimalist, I know Roseanne, Hansen does this and some other people is they take like a yoga mat and they just cut out a little bit of that or there's those egg carton um, sleeping pads that some people use for camping those egg carton sleeping pads you can cut a little bit of that and the thing about that is I don't know exactly what our seats look like on this boat but sometimes they could be cold they could be wet um, having a little thing like that some people fit a little bit of that yoga mat into their a nature journal kit and then they can put that on onto a rock they could put it onto something cold something wet and it um it'll just make you comfortable for longer and that will allow you to focus on nature journaling um and then your feet so skin eyes hands butt feet eyes yeah um so feet is like testing we're not doing very many hikes but testing shoes out before the trip hopefully they're not brand new um shoes and your, the comfort of your feet has like a huge impact on everything else. And if your feet are cold or uncomfortable or, or whatever, it's just gonna have a major effect on everything else. Okay, and then next, so we talked about, um, we talked about our nature journal setup, our overall setup, our outfit, and then as far as nature journaling techniques goes, this is really important. This is basically like what tools do you have ready to grab? So we pull up on an island and I think Jack's gonna probably do his normal thing where he'll be like, you know, here's, here's an approach you could use here. He'll be giving tutorials on like how to draw a bird in flight, things like that. So that'll be really helpful. But in addition to that, like this is the kind of thing you could um, write out onto a sticky note, for example and put that, I love this size sticky notes, by the way, I'll put these in my nature journal. Um, and then I can actually, um, as I go, I could, I could have it here as like a reminder, you know, and then when I turn the page, I can bring this sticky note along um, to the next page. And then this could be sort of like my reminders. In this case, what I'm going to talk about are um, nature journaling uh, techniques, specific techniques that you can decide, you know, like I, hi I, I highly recommend this technique um, or this approach is having like three, three techniques, maybe nature journaling techniques that you know you can use 
And that way you don't have to think too much about what kind of nature journaling technique you're going to use when you're on a random island in the Galapagos. Um, your brain energy should be going into other places besides deciding that. So, for example, um, there's a couple things. Uh, and, and the word that I like to use is constraints. And maybe you've heard this in other art places. There's some famous quotes about how constraints make art better. And it seems counterintuitive, but it's true. This was the second Tanzania trip. So it wasn't my first rodeo. And what I found was um, having my landscape ethos always be the exact same size, that constraint helped me so much. So um, I have a viewfinder that I made for that trip and it was this size, it was a piece of uh, cardstock and I would hold it up, you know, and use it as a viewfinder. And then I would also use it for tracing my landscape ethos that eliminated choices that eliminated choices for me so i wouldn't have to think about oh how big should i make this uh landscape ito let me see the other um so it's like here you can see it as well there's this is a little bit of a variation but you can see there's just these three and this was at the um the lake that we went to louise do you remember that um that lake sort of at the beginning of the trip um but having these um, you know, predetermined size of my landscape ethos was really useful. Another thing you could do is just practice some page layouts. And this is the kind of thing that you could do um, on one of these sheets of paper is for example, you know, do a couple of these, like depending on what format your journal is that you're gonna use, think about like, how do you want to um, you know, divide your page? And a lot of times thinking about it in terms of the rule of thirds is useful. So maybe you want to just say in advance, like, okay, like a landscape ito, um, you know, a description. You really like, uh, you know, written descriptions. And then up here, you can do whatever you want. Maybe it's just um, birds in flight in, in certain instances. And just knowing, like, okay, this is one of my page layout go to options, um, or you could reverse it. Um, and having sometimes just making a choice like this in advance, it seems like it's, uh, you know, taking away your artistic creativity, but it can be really liberating um, to have some of that stuff decided um, in advance. Okay, now I'm going to talk about a couple of the specific techniques so um, that you can be ready to do. So, for example, metadata what is your your metadata approach that you use having that planned out it looks like i didn't really have a consistent one on this trip but um having that sort of planned out in advance can be really helpful and simplifying it looks like i did not so my metadata is kind of all over the place in this one like here i just have the time a little bit about the weather and the location and sort of a, a big sort of like a title um, but your metadata, you know, some people do, I think I showed, uh, I did a video about Roseanne Hansen's technique recently, and she always uses metadata in the same way. Um, let me see if my other book has a, but your metadata is basically just, you know, the box at the top. Here's sort of an example of my metadata. I will often, this is at Point Reyes in California. I put the location, we were looking at elk mostly, the date, and then I do the weather a little bit here. But just having a consistent way that you always do your metadata, that will, and, and maybe knowing that the metadata is the first thing you do on your nature journal page, that could be um, a useful um, and repetitive approach. Or what about your titles? Do you always do the titles in bubble letters at approximately like the same size? Um, or do you just make, I think on this Tanzania trip, what I was doing is I was using um, a, a graphite pencil and I would actually just draw a rectangle at the top of my page and um, fill in the letters later. So lettering can be hard in the field, but you're probably going to be having time at night in your cot or whatever where you could do um, this lettering. But maybe what you need is um, in the moment just to... Um, sketch out the location of it.
Um, so I mentioned landscape ethos already. Um, that would be one of the things to have in your toolkit would be um, landscape ethos. Another example would be species profile, question storms. Uh, maybe there's voyage details about, you know, like what our trip is doing. Maps would be another one. Do you, you know, have a system and a size on your page for sketching little maps? Um, I'm going to actually print out a bunch of maps on like sticky paper um, that people could stick into their journals and then you could draw on it. One thing I also like to do is use resume paper. Resume paper is pretty good to um, do watercolor on. So um, you can print out resume paper uh, maps and then um, paint and draw on it um, afterwards. Another thing to do is another thing that you could have in your technique toolkit would be um, creative writing. Like maybe you have a way to take like a paragraph uh, to write like a paragraph about what's happening or a haiku even or um, daily recaps. Like maybe at the end of every day, you sort of write a little bit of a log. Um, that's what I usually end up doing on um, my voyages because I have a lot of time by myself. So I'll have, you know, maybe at the end of the page, um, the end of a day, this is basically my recap right here. This is basically just creative writing. Um, it's in stages what happened. Um, that would be a really useful thing to have. Another one I mentioned is question storms. If, um, you know, we show up on an island and um, you don't, and there's like these uh, turtles, uh, tortoises or uh, land iguanas or something, marine iguanas or birds nesting, one thing you can have in your toolkit of maybe three or five things is just question storms and all you do is you know all right now I'm just going to write down as many questions about this weird thing I'm looking at as possible and you just have that as one of your elements um, what were some of my other ones that I think would be good to practice would be um, drawing from memory uh, maybe there's things that you could be doing drawing from memory at the end of the day or drawing from photos later um, in your cot um, and then two other things that could be in your toolkit would be collections um, or the human component. Let me see if I have an example of collections here. Um, collections is another nature journaling technique that you should um, know about if you don't already. Um, it's really useful. Um, this could be an example, even though this wasn't done in the field. This was um, sort of practice actually for the Galapagos, but a collection is basically when you nature journal a bunch of different related things on the same page. And a more recent example that I did on the nature journal show, I actually did it with my salad. So this is literally my salad mix right here. So, I mean, how, uh, it, it's uh, how far from the Galapagos can you get? But basically the concept is you just have a bunch of things that are sort of in the same category. Um, and you just do little drawings of each one, little descriptions, and that's a collection. So it's like maybe one of your five, th five nature journaling strategies is a collection. So here's an example of a, a menu, for example, you know, that might be a long list and some of you might be like, oh my gosh, that's overwhelming. But it could be like this. You could decide and just have this on a sticky note that you're gonna do, you know, a landscape ito at each place we go to, maybe or one landscape ito a day, uh, a species profile, and a collection. And then maybe you do a daily recap, like just some creative journaling, uh, creative writing, um, you know, at night, like one for five minutes or something. And that could have, not only does that just give you four things that you know what to do when you show up at a place, um, but it also um, could lead to, you know, uh, an aesthetically pleasing mixture of written word and images on your page and basically less decisions for you um, in the moment. Marley, what is the yes. species profile? The species profile is something that you've probably done before. Let me see if I can find a good example. Oh, here's probably a good example. Um, it's probably it's probably what you often do when you're nature journaling and you show up and there is a plant or an animal and you just um, draw about that 
um, one thing. So none of these are good examples because they're showing multiple things. But um, and you might show it from different perspectives. Exactly. Or the head exactly. turning or. Yeah, exactly. You've totally done this before. I'll just draw one out on here real quick. But like species profile, say there is a frigate bird flying behind the boat. So I could um, draw the frigate bird, you know, in flight or whatever. They have those crazy tails. I, I, I'm not looking at one right now, so I'm probably messing up the wing thing. Um, and then, you know, maybe I'm really interested in the tail, like you're saying, so I could do a zoom in over here and maybe have like, you know, what the tail looks like up close on one of the points. And then you look up the information about the name. So you could have like a title. You could have the Latin name or whatever here. And then you could, you know, add whatever you want that you do from either research or that you see there. It could be question. You could do an I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of here with your questions and observations in a Wermo. Okay. Yeah. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So a species profile is a really classic one. This will fit really well with probably, you know, how our trip is going to go. A lot of times people when they're in nature and we, we're going to have like a naturalist guide who's going to be probably giving us all of this natural history information. People often compartmentalize nature into these sort of species profiles. So, you know, it's a it's a good technique. It's a it's a tested technique. It's also can be a little bit limiting. You know, sometimes nature is more about relationships or comparisons, um, but this would be a good one to have on your, um, you know, toolkit. So I would recommend something like landscape ethos, species profile, collection, and daily recap. Um, that would be an example of, um, you know, these this toolkit that you're ready to metaphorically just reach in and grab that tool. When you show up on the island, you know whether it's time to do, uh, whether it makes more sense to do a species profile or a collection. Uh, maybe a collection would make more sense. And um, that's sort of what I recommend in terms of nature journaling toolkit. And then the other thing is, these are just examples that I'm giving. And these are some sort of ones that um, Jack or other people in the community have come up with. These are tested nature journaling techniques. But maybe you have another one that's totally different. Maybe it's something about like, how you um, visualize or draw um, what you're noticing um, from sounds, you know? But like, if you look in Jack's book, you can see a lot of times the lessons or a lot of times the lessons he's given online or on his website, they're broken down into these specific nature journaling techniques. So basically what I'm recommending is just have a list of like four of those that you like or you've tested um, and be ready to pull those out when it's time. Um, okay, so that is nature journaling techniques. And then the next thing that I'm um, suggesting for preparing for a nature journaling expedition is to have um, studio art practice. And so I think a lot of times when people have, have asked about like, how do I prepare for these trips in advance? All they're thinking about is this part. So basically the things that I think are great to practice um, our speed. Um, it doesn't sound that romantic, but being able to draw fast or just nature journal fast is probably one of the most useful things you can come up with. So for example, um, when I was in Tanzania and I had a chameleon on my, this was after the, the um, safari, this chameleon was um, in the thatch roof above my tent. And so I actually caught it and while I was holding it and I was walking around on my arm, I had a limited amount of time. I could have totally froze. So this is a good time to be clear with your intentions. Like I sometimes in these situations, I freeze up and I'm just like goggling or whatever the word ogling nature. And I just want to stare at it and be like, that's amazing. But then later I might be sad and maybe I didn't actually have a deeper connection or nature experience just by staring at it for longer. So being able to go um, really fast, even if it's sort of cartoony type things like this, I think is um, worthwhile and being able to write down stuff quickly. So um, drawing fast is just practice and then writing fast. I try not to um, 
worry about grammar, obviously, in my nature journal. But one thing that can be really useful is how to um, think of questions, for example, in one word. So like if you're doing I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, or you're writing questions about a blue-footed booby or an albatross, um, sometimes you can phrase a question in fewer words, and that means you can write it down faster and keep making more observations. So for example, age, question mark. That is a one word question. Um, you could say maybe like food chain question mark that entails like a lot of information into a short thing. So that's fast, um, um, just practicing drawing quickly and not being worried about it. So that goes to the next studio art practice, which I really recommend developing is um, courage. So some people have been using the term fearless in terms of nature journaling. And I know for myself, my art trajectory in my life has been very fearful and perfectionist um, but coming up with like a courageous way there's going to be fear um, but being courageous and committed and just going straight to ink for example um, and being able to just get stuff on the paper and not worry about it you're, it doesn't need to be a perfect drawing even if you have a scribble of a, a wonky drawing of a Galapagos turtle, you know, you look at that in the future and that's gonna be an amazing artifact to have. Whereas nothing on the page because you were paralyzed or worrying about how to get its proportions perfectly is not gonna be um, useful. Um, and then of course there's practice drawing targets, your targets. So that's what I was, that, that's what those geckos were before. So I'm obviously really interested in reptiles. So I got a book about all the reptiles in the Galapagos. And before the Tanzania trip, I just drew every single animal that was known to exist in Tanzania. And that took forever. And that may or may not be your cup of tea, but you can practice drawing these things before you see them, especially if they're quicker moving or you're not going to have that many chances once we're there. Um, another really fun thing to do is practicing the palette of the place, the palette of the place. What are the colors that you think you're going to be needing a lot? You could do a little research online, get your watercolor palette, start testing those colors and thinking about which are those colors and make sure you're not almost out. You might realize, wow, there's a lot of this weird serpentine genuine green or something and make sure you're not about to run out of that color on the trip and realize like, oh, buff titanium is actually the color that everything look, everything is that color down here. I really wish I had that. And the other really liberating thing about that is for people who are, you know, not as comfortable with the realistic drawings of like complicated animals, maybe just getting color swatches at each island could be a really cool way to um, add to a little bit of your um, written description of things. The palette of the place is really powerful. I know sometimes when I'm exhausted and I don't feel like drawing anything, I'll just get on my watercolor palette and I'll start making little swatches trying to represent either, it could be your feelings, so it could be more subjective or it could be trying to show the colors that you see there. Um, I'm gonna share a book list because um, the last thing after studio art practice is topical research. So um, in addition to drawing some of your targets, you could read about them. Um, I think this is something that there's gonna be a lot of opportunities on the boat and with, within the Galapagos group. Um, but before any trip, you know, going to the library or looking up all the books at the library, listening to audiobooks about that place can be um, really powerful. Um, I really like this song of the dodo, and I think there's a whole, um, it's easy to find a lot of stuff about the Galapagos, um, and um, doing a little bit of study of that in advance can be really great too. So those are my top tips, sort of in order of priority, actually. So going from setting an intention, creating a nature journaling habit before the tip, and then into specific training. Um, so the specific training was dialing in your nature journaling setup, dialing in your outfit, um, nature journaling technique toolkit, studio art practice, and topical research.